Hello again. Um, over the past few weeks, months, <laughs> I've been talking about camera gear and diving into various bits and pieces. And I thought it was probably time that I spoke about the old, um, I guess, elephant in the room. And that is whether you go for DSLR or mirrorless. So I have spoken about this before, but it is um, a question I know for a lot of people, particularly if you're new to photography and perhaps you're a little bit overcome by the jargon and all the other stuff that goes on and you're really not sure about what the differences are between the two and which one you should think about buying. So just to start, the fundamental difference between the two um, is that DSLR cameras and DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. What that means is it's um, or what, what it means in practice is that it's a camera where you have a body and you have interchangeable lenses and it uses a digital sensor, not film. So if you've seen DSLR cameras, sorry, SLR cameras, uh, that single lens reflex that refers to um, film cameras. So essentially, when digital started to get more popular and um, develop more, the digital sensor replaced the film in the camera. So hence the connection between the two. And the way that you can see what you're about to shoot in a DSLR is through a viewfinder, which is on the top of the camera. It uses a mirror, which sits in front of the um, sensor. And when you press the shutter button, that mirror flips up and whatever you're focused on, whatever the lens is looking at, um, that is what hits the sensor. So that in a very crude way, is how a DSLR works. With a mirrorless camera, you basically don't have the viewfinder and you don't have the mirror. So it means that mechanically the camera is much simpler. You don't have the lens assembly and the mirror assembly. And the technology that you use to get your picture is different. So it's more like um, a shooting movie. And technically, your smartphone is a mirrorless camera because it doesn't have a mirror and it uses, uses the same sort of technology. Essentially, the lens, what comes through the lens, just hits the sensor without worrying about a mirror. Now, that's kind of very simply what the difference is. Um, what I'm going to do in this podcast, just talk a little bit about what are the differences that are relevant to you. And the thing to think about through all of this, and when you're reading reviews or looking at comparisons, all that kind of stuff, is to think about the photography you want to do. Because there are a lot of technological advantages, definitely on the mirrorless systems these days, but whether or not you need those advantages, um, as I've said, depends on what kind of photography you're doing. And also other things like um, if you've got big hands and big fingers, because mirrorless cameras are generally much smaller, it means that any buttons, switches on the body them itself might be much smaller. And also on the touch screen, if you've got a smaller touch screen, you do have soft buttons on there. So just buttons that come up on the screen that you press on the touch screen. Again, they might be awkward for you to use. So a big thing to consider here is how comfortable is it for you to use that particular camera. So I guess to start the ball rolling, who is making DSR, DSLR cameras these days and who's making mirrorless? Well, basically the traditional manufacturers, so I'm talking your Canons, your Nikons and all these kind of guys, um, Olympus, people that you would have known if you've been around for a while um, and associate them with even film cameras going back quite a while, um, they still have DSLRs available for sale, new, but their development is all going into mirrorless cameras. And the only company that is the exception to that rule at the moment is Pentax. And Pentax are definitely known for the, the sort of high quality um, cameras. So they are sticking with DSLR development, at least um, to the best of my knowledge, as I record this in 2024. Um, so what are the differences between the two? Well, the obvious one is the construction. And 
the size of the two. So, as I've said, DSLR has viewfinder on it, the mirrorless doesn't. Um, the things that tend to be the same, unless you're going up at the pro end of the scale, if you're talking sort of mid to low range um, cameras, there is not a huge amount that's different between the two in terms of the sensors, the image quality, and the core features that they have. However, there are some differences that may or may not be relevant to you, and we'll just have a look at those now. So I've mentioned that DSLR uses a mirror that flips up. A lot of, I'm not going to say all DSLRs, you're going to have to check this with what you're looking at, but certainly the DSLRs that I use, and I use Canon, um, I have a, an EOS 5D and a EOS 5DS, I should say, and um, an EOS 7D Mark II. Now, both of those, although they're mirrorless cameras, they have a thing called Live View. And what that does is it basically flips the mirror up and keeps it up. And so the camera now works in the same way um, that a mirrorless camera will work. And the advantage of that for me and where I tend to use it is either shooting video, and I'll come back to video, or if I want to control the camera using my um, PC. So there is a cable. Um, it connects to my um, laptop, and I can then control the camera. I can up and download stuff, but I can also control the shooting of the camera. I can control the focus. I can do all that kind of stuff. So if I'm recording video... And I've been recording um, a, a, a series of, um, a, well, basically a training program, nothing to do with photography. But when I do that, when I've recorded photography videos, either video blogs or training videos, I'll tend to use that feature. So that may or may not be useful to you, but on um, a lot of DSLRs, as I said, I'm not going to say all, you've got that option to use Live View. And in that instance, you're then using the camera in the same way that the uh, mirrorless camera works. Now, the autofocus auto system used to be an area where mirrorless struggled because DSLR actually has a couple of systems and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter too much. If you want to find out more, by all means do, but I won't go into it in this podcast. But DSLR cameras have a very good older system that works when the mirror is down. So it's the way, to, uh, I, when you're just looking through the viewfinder, and in the days before mirrorless came along, that was all fine. But when you use um, the live view mode, then it actually has to use a different autofocus system. And that's similar, although not as good as what's on mirrorless cameras these days, because they just use that system all the time. And as I've said, that's what one of the areas where development is going on. So that's an area that you will see increasing improvement. Is that important? Honestly, in a lot of situations, probably not. It's most relevant where you're tracking a fast-moving object. And again, DSLRs are pretty good um, at that. And, and I'm speaking as a wildlife photographer. Um, they're generally pretty good. However, if you are really pushing things to the extreme, if you are doing a lot of sports photography, a lot of wildlife where things are moving fast, uh, motorsport, anything like that, you will probably find that the newer mirrorless systems are better. So that's just something to think about. That's one of the, the factors that might influence your decision. Um, in terms of viewfinders themselves, the early mirrorless cameras didn't have fantastic um, screens on the back. There was a lot of lag between or noticeable lag between what was going on in front of the camera and what was being displayed on the screen at the back. That also has been improved. Um, obviously, if you're using a viewfinder on a DSLR, you're looking, you're just using a mirror, so you're seeing everything live. You can see exactly what's going on. Um, but these days, uh, mirrorless have, to a large extent, reduced that lag so it's not a problem. And in fact, one thing to think about uh, if, you're, if you're doing wildlife, for one thing, is how much noise does the camera make when it flip this is DSLRs how much noise does the camera make when it flips the mirror up now I've listened <laughs> I was with a photographer another photographer in India and she had an older it was actually um, a D1 
and I forget which which version it was, but it was the um, the D one, which was the is the top level DSLR um, pro camera that Canon make, and it's an amazing camera, very very good. But the racket that came from that particular camera when she was doing um, shooting the burst because you can hear the camera coming up and down all the time that that noise it was actually very loud and I was shooting a bit, bit of video on my Canon at the time and you can hear it very clearly so if you are doing the kind of photography where you don't want to make any noise then definitely think about mirrorless now some DSLRs are better than others uh, mine have quiet modes but even so, it still makes some noise. I mean, it's it's impossible to get rid of it, uh, really, and still also have a reasonable burst performance. And what I mean by that is how many frames per second do you need to shoot in bursts to capture a sequence of action shots? So have a think about that. And again, um, frames per second, that's another area where mirrorless has overtaken DSLRs because on a DSLR you might be getting something in the region of, I don't know, I think top ones give you around 12 to 14 frames per second. But with um, the new mirrorless cameras, you're looking, and I'm actually just checking my notes here because I was doing a little bit of research. Uh, Some of them are, um, yeah, over a 1,000 frames per second. Now, that might be insane (laughs) because the counter to that is how many frames can you actually store on your camera. Uh, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment, at least on one charge. But it does make the difference that you're probably not going to want thousands. If you are, that's really specialised, and um, that's a whole other thing to think about. Uh, but if you do want to, say, have 20 to 30 frames per second, because you've got a lot of stuff going on, the chances are that's going to be more than a DSLR will be able to cope with. DSLR mirror technology is, is really good, mechanically it's it's absolutely it's absolutely astounding how fast they move because 30 frames per second means that mirror is trying to move 30 30 times a second it's not going to do that 14 times um, a second is still very very fast if you think about it you know one one thousand that's a second pretty much and that mirror is just operated 13 or 14 times but that is you know, it's a real limitation. And one of the things I found with my 5DS, and this relates more to um, the frame, the, the image size, because it produces very large images. Um, the files are about 70 megs ago. Uh, I can burst probably for five, maybe six times, a se- you know, in a burst, I'll do five or six frames a second. But if I try and hold it up, it'll do a second or two, but then it has to pause while it's writing to the memory card. Now, my cameras are a few years old now. Uh, That may not be so much of an issue, but it's another thing just to think about. And if you do want to shoot very big images, for whatever reason, I shoot big because I potentially want to print them out and have, um, you know, a one-sized prints. Now, the camera itself can't produce big enough files to do that. Uh, But with software, I can get the files to a quality where they can do that but I want to be starting with the biggest file size I can initially because that uh, raw file that's that size has a lot of information in it and I need to build on that to get these really big images so if you're not shooting very large images that burst speed in terms of what the camera can write to the memory card uh, that may not be an issue but it's another thing just to think about and what I'll recommend, and I'll come back to it at the end, is that you do try out, if possible, any camera you're thinking about buying and just shoot probably the more extreme to the more extreme performance you need uh, for the kind of photography you're going to be doing most of the time. Uh, your, your camera needs to be able to deliver for you, obviously. So um, that's a thing to think about, you know, what kind of um, uh, burst speeds uh, do you need to be able to cope with what's the the sort of maximum frames per second or even on on more regular work what kind of frame rate do you need um, and that will also potentially point you one way or the other now i've already mentioned that the camera bodies themselves tend to be smaller 
which could well be an advantage because it also means they're generally lighter because you don't have the mirror and all of the mechanical things that you need to make the mirror operate. And that was definitely one of the big advantages of mirrorless cameras when they first came out, that they were smaller and lighter than the DSLR equivalent. However, as I've said, the kind of cameras we're talking about, or I'm talking about here, are the kind of cameras where you have a body and then you have different lenses that will fit that body. And if you use telephoto a lot, the chances are you're going to find that the mirrorless lenses are actually not that much different in size to the same lenses for DSLR. Now, that will be different when you get to micro four-thirds cameras and Olympus OM and Panasonic cameras are very good in this area and they are physically smaller. It's a smaller sensor and they've actually scaled everything down. So if you really need to have that telephoto capability, but weight and size are are key factors for you, then I would definitely suggest you explore the possibility of these um, micro four thirds cameras. So they're not full frame cameras. Uh, But if you go to full frame mirrorless cameras, this is where you're going to find the lenses are more or less the same. Now, one thing that is an advantage is that some manufacturers, uh, Canon is one of them who have done this from the start, their full frame mirrorless cameras will accept DSLR lenses, um, I believe that's the EF series lenses, without any loss of performance. So that means you've still got full um, AF performance, you've still got all the, the full range of the aperture available, for, you know, as much light as you can get in. So that is a real advantage if you are moving from a DSLR or thinking about moving from a DSLR system to mirrorless, but you're worried about having to buy a whole lot of new lenses. Because if you're anything like me, the lenses that I have cost, you know, 2,000 euros maybe to replace to get the same lens or the, the new version of the lens. And if you've got a few of those, that gets very expensive very quickly. So if you have been using DSLR for a while and you're thinking of going across to mirrorless, but you're concerned about the cost of investment, I mean, I've spoken about buying cameras before. I've spoken about the system. Think about the system. And in fact, the part of the system that you're more more likely to change more often is actually the camera body. Whereas I've got lenses that are 25 years old now, 20, 25 years old. They work fine. I get them serviced when I need to. Uh, But like I say, there's a couple of thousand euros worth of lens there each time. So I'm going to get and I have got my money's worth from those lenses. So these are pro lenses. These are Canon Pro Series lenses. So that is another thing to think about. And also the variety of lenses available. Now, that has been, and in one sense, remains the advantage of DSLRs that they have, you know, 30 years worth of lens development available to you. But the the advantage for mirrorless, even though they don't have the same range of lenses available, that's where uh, the main camera camera manufacturers and the lens manufacturers are putting their efforts. So Canon, Nikon, but also Sigma and those sorts of people who the independent lens manufacturers are tending to focus on mirrorless because they see that as being the future of photography and certainly consumer photography and also uh, professional photography in in the sort of day-to-day area. So that's where the new lens development is going in. So if you're thinking ahead and where you might want to invest in lenses in the future, the likelihood is that mirrorless will deliver far more performance and quality and features in terms of autofocus and all that kind of thing, Um, subject tracking. That's likely to be mirrorless in the future. So... I would say for now, if you've got a DSLR system and you've been holding back because you're worried about, you know, you're not just looking at changing the camera body, but the whole system, then do, depending on what system you're currently using, do look look at which cameras are available, the camera bodies in the mirrorless side, which will operate with your current lenses. And then you can move, you can switch over. And, and gradually kind of migrate your current DSLR system to mirrorless. And you can do it 
at a reasonable price at each each time. So that is something to think about. Now, if you don't use telephoto, if you tend to use um, smaller lenses, then you'll probably find that you can take full advantage of the size and weight advantages that mirrorless offers. And again, it comes back to the kind of photography you're doing. But if you're a landscape photographer, for example, uh, it does mean that you can have a smaller, um, physically smaller and lighter kit set up to go off and do your landscape work. So that's got to be an advantage. Um, another thing about mirrorless, because they tend to be smaller and lighter, you've, you're less concerned about uh, camera shake, which will tend to get on heavier gear. So something else to um, think about there. One area where um, mirrorless definitely has an advantage is uh, video. Now, most DSLR cameras that I'm aware of, um, both new and what you're likely to find secondhand, depending how old they are, will give you a video capability and the newer ones will give you 4K. But... As far as I can establish, that's as good as you're likely to get on DSLR. So if video is your primary thing, and to be fair, people like Canon, I know have dedicated video bodies as well that will work with their lenses. This is going back to DSLR days. There was a definite split. Um, But if you're looking at going to uh, 6K and definitely 8K capture, and there's also RAW, 10-bit video, high frame rates, all this kind of stuff, then I would say realistically you're you're looking at mirrorless because mirrorless technology is moving in that direction. And if that's something that you um will want to use in the future, this very these very high performance video systems, then you do need, I think honestly, you want to be thinking of mirrorless as you move forward. Um the downside to mirrorless is there battery life and this still remains a big difference and obviously if you're using video there's less of a difference between between the two systems Um, but when you're using um, a lot of uh, video you're going to be getting through your battery faster but if you're doing stills because you've got a live view screen on the mirrorless camera you will still be burning through your battery much faster than you will with the DSLR so to give you an idea, and again, it comes back to the photography you're doing, how easily it, can you either recharge your battery or just stick another battery in there. Um, that's another option you have, obviously, with both systems. Um, with DSLR, you can, with battery life, you're probably looking at um, maybe over a 1,000 images, depending exactly what image size you're using and various other things. But it could be in the region of a thousand. You could probably fill a memory card up on a single battery charge. Whereas with the mirrorless cameras, you're still limited often to 350 to 400 frames before you have to change the battery. Another thing, again, I'm, I'm aware I'm sort of bouncing a little bit, but on the subject of batteries, one of the things I've done with both my um, cameras, my um, EOS uh 5DS and my EOS 7D Mark II is to buy a body extender so it screws onto the bottom of the camera body and it allows you to have a second battery in um, in the camera. So basically on both of my cameras I use them with two batteries in there. So that gives me obviously a longer battery life so I can um, or, or effective battery life when I'm using the camera. It means I, I've set, you know got two battery lines in there. The main reason for doing it, though, and this comes back to size and weight, is that I just find the camera much easier to handle with a telephoto lens on it with that extra weight at the bottom. Because what it does, it moves the center of gravity of the body and lens combination back towards me a little bit because I've just added slightly more weight with the um, of this unit that screws onto the bottom of the, the body, but I've also got a second battery in there. And... Again, you know, the handling of the camera, I think, is very important because I've used the camera with a telephoto without that unit on the bottom. And I just find it, it's not as comfortable for me to use. I'm working harder to keep things in frame and not shake. So, again, it comes back to handling and 
think about what your options are with the setup you're looking at and, and how does it handle, how comfortable is it to use. So the final thing I just want to cover on this is dust. And um, I just came across it reading somebody else's article and it's something I hadn't particularly thought about. Some mirrorless cameras are more susceptible to dust than others and they are generally more susceptible than DSLR. And the reason for that is if you look at a DSLR camera, the sensor is in the sort of back of the body and most of the time the lens is covering it. So you've got some protection um, to stop dust getting onto the sensor and obviously that comes up in the images. Um, Cameras these days have um, a, a sensor cleaning mechanism which basically shakes it to get rid of the dust, but some work better than others, that's for sure. The... In a mirrorless camera, the sensor is much closer to um, the front of the camera and it's not covered because you are effectively in live view all the time. So there's nothing covering the sensor. So it does mean that when you're changing lenses, you will have to be much more careful about the environment that you're in. And I've been in situations where I've had to switch lenses in quite dusty conditions. So I've been very, very careful about that. Um, And I'll generally arrange some sort of a cover so that I can, um, you know, protect everything much more and stop uh, dust coming in. So that might be a blanket over my head uh, with me under the blanket switching lenses so that, you know, stray dust doesn't get in. Um, So that might be a factor. It's something that some people have noticed. On the other hand, it's much easier to clean a mirrorless camera sensor simply because it isn't covered and it is near the front. Whereas to actually get to the sensor in a, in a uh, DSLR is much harder because you've got all that mirror assembly in the way and it's down at the back. So that is something that, um, you know, that's for a professional workshop to handle and that's going to cost you money. Okay, so I'm conscious that I've gone through a fair number of things. Um, I'm going to recap. <laughs> I'll try and key, recap the key things. Um, I think two important things really to bear in mind, though, before I do that, is first of all, all of this stuff is very easy to get into what we used to call specmanship when I was um, working in a more technical environment. And, and what I mean what I mean by that is that it's, it's easy to get caught up with the bigger or the better specs, you know, the Frames per second is one I've given on burst as an example. How many images can you store? Um, all this, all these sorts of things. But they're only relevant if they apply to your photography. So the thing to bear in mind is what is the sort of photography that you do and what are the important features for you? And I would argue that most people, you're not using really high burst speeds, um, when you're photographing um, subjects, you don't need um, low light particularly. Um, you might be using a flash gun. Uh, one thing I will say, the mirrorless gives you a better display in low light, um, but there is a downside with how the um, how they work with the um, uh, flash gun. So look at flash gun operation and make sure that, um, that uh, you're getting the infrared um the infrared AF will work with your mirrorless because they don't always. So um, if you are if you do use flash photography, first of all, try it if you can and look at what the um the recommended flash options are. So most manufacturers will have a flash gun that will work with that camera and they're designed designed to work together. So do look into that if you do a lot of flash photography. I don't, so it's not an area that I get into, but it just um something that just popped into my head. So think about though what do you how do you normally use the camera? Is there exceptional use that you do from time to time? So you want those features on the camera. That might be where the spec side comes in. But if it doesn't, then ignore all that stuff. You know, just get back to, well, how often, how, how far are you going to carry it? Is the size and weight important? How easy is the camera to use? Do you have big hands, big fingers? Do you find these little touch screens awkward to use? I, I do sometimes on my phone. And I don't think I've got particularly large fingers, but um, I do find those irritating from time to time um do you want to spend a lot of money because dslrs are still cheaper 
uh, if you buy them new. Uh, the capabilities on a mid-range or even a beginner or a, you know low level, I'm not call it beginners, but a, a lower priced camera setup are adequate for most people. And mirrorless do cost more. The other thing you've got is if you start looking at the second-hand market, you can get some amazing deals on DSLR for the very reason that a lot of people who started with DSLRs, and here we, you know, I'm talking about good quality, high spec DSLRs. They're exchanging them for mirrorless cameras, so they want to get rid of them. So they're so the second hand market for DSLRs is um, really a bit of a buyer's market right now. Mirrorless, on the other hand, are more expensive. Uh, I used to say I, I would probably not buy a mirrorless body simply because the technology is changing so fast. Um, I, I would say we're probably reaching a point now where it is worth buying a body. And the reason I say that, um, or what was saying that, is that if I don't want to buy something that not only is big, is going to have um, technology in it that's out of date very quickly, but that 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 technology doesn't actually do what I want it to do. And the new technology coming through gives me what I need. So I'm one of these all tend to hold back until um, this, the newer technology will deliver what I need. So all of this ties back to what, what kind of photography you do, how easy is the camera to use. So key things to think about this price, size and weight, and a bigger camera might actually be an advantage. So it's something to think about. Um, battery use, uh, you, you know, can you, is, is the battery life important to you? If you are serious about video, uh, you definitely want to be looking at mirrorless, even if the mirrorless cameras now don't do quite what you want as you transition your system. If you have an existing system, you do want to be thinking about mirrorless for sure. So yeah, that is probably pretty much it. I hope that has made some sense. Um, and I haven't waffled too much. <laughs> but I did think it was worth revisiting this whole mirrorless DSLR discussion. And, um, you know, honestly, as I've said, for most people, either camera will work. It comes down to what are you doing on the edges? You know, if if, if you're doing regular work and one clearly is the winner, then there's no discussion. But if you're uh, an average user, look at cost. I like to get at least five years out of my camera bodies um, and use them regularly. So it is important, I think, that you get good value for money from whatever you buy. And if you can, do try it out. You know, do try the thing out, do the kind of photography that you would normally do and just look at the results you get, how easy it is to use and the kind of quality that you um, can get from the camera. That's it for now. I will speak to you again in the next podcast. Just before I go, I want to let you know that there's a couple of ways you can support me if you feel so inclined. Uh, with the podcast, Buzzsprout, which is the um, the platform I use for all of my podcasts, they have a subscription model. So if you feel that you would like to subscribe, a few dollars, a few euros, whatever, um, to the podcast, that would be much appreciated. The other option is my Patreon membership. So if you'd like to become a patron, and that starts at the price of a cup of coffee every month, You'll get access to exclusive material, behind-the-scenes material, photography tips, all this kind of stuff, depending on which tier you're at. So there is some information available through my website and um, also on the, uh, uh, the written text to go with this podcast. So if you choose either one, thank you so much in advance. And whether or not you do, I hope you uh, continue to enjoy the podcast and let other people know about them. Thank you very much. Bye for now.